Well, good afternoon, good morning, or good evening, depending upon where you are in the world, and welcome to today's DevOps.com webinar. I'm Charlene O'Hanlon, moderator for today's event, and I welcome you. As always, we have a great event on tap, but before we get started, we do have a few housekeeping items we need to go over. First of all, today's event is being recorded, so if you miss any or all of the event, you will have the opportunity to access it later on. Following today's webinar, we will be sending out an email that contains a link to access the webinar on demand. And we are taking questions from the audience. So if at any time during today's presentation you have a question for our speaker, please don't wait, don't hesitate. Just use your GoToWebinar control panel and submit your question, and we'll try to get to as many as we can near the end of today's webinar. Also happening at the end of today's webinar, we will be doing a drawing for four $25 Amazon gift cards. So please stick around. Hopefully you'll be one of our four lucky winners. All right, with that, we'll go ahead and kick off today's webinar, which is Dev Friendly Security Rules. Our speaker today is Aaron Balakrishnan, who is Director of Products at Shift Left. Aaron, thank, thank you so much for joining me today. Really appreciate your being here. Thanks, Charlene, and thanks for the intro. Um, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Aaron here, uh, the host for your webinar today. And thank you for joining us um, for the topic, Dev Friendly Security Rules. Now, um, th this is an interesting topic, and um, and I'm hoping that's what got you excited to join us today. So the agenda for today is to look at why um, developers and security don't get along very well in this um, modern software development lifecycle. Um, what are the issues that lead up to it? Um, what are possible solutions or approaches to make that better? Um, give a quick um, demo of some of those things in action and also some criteria that we see among our customers when when they look for uh, similar solutions uh, solutions that uh, make security possible without uh, alienating or compromising our developer productivity and right, so that's kind of the uh, agenda for today uh, at, at any point as charlene mentioned please do send me questions uh, in the question box and I'll get to them at the end of the webinar. So to, to get started, we did a survey recently um, among a developer community, and we had around 150 plus respondents uh, across the world, right? Uh, so I think around 20 plus countries, um, mostly developers, uh, development managers, team leads, um, other ones who responded. And when we looked at the the number, one thing that very much stood out is this one stat, and where almost everyone who responded said there's a huge disconnect between application security and engineering workflows. And that is very much hurting their productivity. Right? Uh, productivity from everything from working on new feature releases, working on fixing existing bugs, um, chain hot fixes, um, going back and uh, doing some security fixes, uh, whatever may it be that um, they do in the pipeline, they believe this workflow disconnect is causing them to, um, or hurting their productivity. So, so this got us thinking here at Shift Left, um, as, as you can imagine from the name shift left, it, we are trying to make things more closer to the left, uh, left being uh, developers in that software development life cycle. And we are thinking like, if, if this is true and, and which is obvious from the response, um, what could be done to make this better? But before we got to what could be done to make this better, we were thinking, okay, why is this disconnect, right? Like what, what is causing this disconnect? Um, what, what are the root causes um, that we need to be solving for? So we looked at what is being done in the life cycle today. Right? So th this is a, a familiar image uh, to all developers. Uh, most of these uh, iconography comes from um, places like GitHub, GitLab kind of environments. Right? And um, so 
to quickly explain what you're seeing. Well, this this master branch of code that is long living, and um, imagine a developer or a team is tasked with working on a feature. Right, so they would um, create of a feature branch, um, start making some commits to it, make a pull request, um, do some bug fixing on top of it, and then do a peer review, and then it gets merged into the the main branch. Um, and then the master branch is where the rest of the process keeps continuing, right? So it's um, depending on how big the company is or how um, what the process looks like. Maybe it is multiple times a day, maybe once a week, once a month. Uh, they would do build, deploy, test, and release of the master branch. Right. So this is good from a, a software development um, life cycle life cycle perspective. But then when we were looking at how AppSec works on top of this, this is what AppSec does, right? So wherein at some point in time, um, in, in most big organizations, this is some point in time after the release happens, the code in the master branch is then being pulled and static analysis is being performed on top of it. Right? And then the application security team realizes, okay, legacy tools, um, they give a lot of results, right? So if, if I just throw that off to the development team, it is not going to be met with, um, um, it, it's not going to be happy situation. So they do some basic triaging, uh, the AppSec team does. They look at things based on their knowledge of the application of the code base. They do triaging to figure out, okay, are these false positives? Are they res relevant? Can we hide some of these, maybe we don't need to care about some of these. The security team might have defined some policies. Uh, they might say, okay, hey, this application um, is external facing, so we need to care about SQL injection. Uh, this application doesn't have uh, maybe a web um, interface, or maybe um, say cross-site scripting is not relevant, right? So, so they, they might have some policies like these, uh, which also helps with triaging. So they do that. And then they sent off the vulnerabilities to the development team, right? Um, so you can immediately notice a disconnect here. So like some developer created or worked on a feature, but that developer is not the one who is getting the feedback from AppSec. It is a development team in general, right? Because it's tough for an AppSec team to know who needs to get this vulnerability report. So immediately this starts off posing a bunch of questions for the dev team. Right? So questions like, okay, first obvious question is, okay, who wrote this piece of code? Right? Uh, depending on how long that cycle is between pull request and merge to release to them pulling the code. Um, for all you know, the dev who wrote that piece of code might not be on the team anymore. They might be working on some other team, some other part of the organization. Uh, for all you know, they might not even be in the company any longer. Um, so, so that is that first question. And then even if they figure out the dev who wrote it, it's like, I wrote this code ages back. Right? I wrote this code three months ago and I'm off on a different feature now. I need to change my thought process. I need to like figure out what that logic was. I need to go look at the requirements again, maybe. Uh, so it's, it's tough to change that. Um, focus um, on such short notice. And then the two boxes in the, the green, right? So the first obvious response from development team is these are a lot of false positives, right? Where the AppSec team does triaging, but they're not close to the code. They don't understand the, the intricacies of the logic of what is written in the code because that is not their day job. Um, so the moment you put on that hat, where you know what is happening in the application, you might realize that, hey, no, this is the tool just doesn't understand the code. And so it's a bunch of false positives. Now I spend time on triaging this further. That's one. And then imagine you do get to that true positive vulnerability. Then you're like, oh, but then there's so much of code that has been written on top of it. Maybe this is in a common library, which I don't even own. Um, so if that library cannot be fixed and I have to rewrite a lot of code to make this fixed. Um, 
So you can imagine there is this, this is what was leading to that initial uh, response, the, the stat that I put up of 96 percentage. With this thinking, you can realize dev team productivity will definitely be hit, right? So you first is to figure out who, then figure out if it is real. And even if it is real, and if it's getting to the right person, it's figuring out, out okay, how do I now go about fixing it? And it is all well and good if developers were measured or tasked with doing this, but this is on top of what they are already tasked with doing, which is developing features and developing new code, right? So this is definitely taking them off track and, and, and making them um, less productive. So, and this is very much a bigger problem these days. Uh, the, the previous model might have worked um, years back when development cycles were slow, right? Like when you had three months to do a release and then towards the end of three months, if security team were to come and do the analysis and give you back results, you still had time to work on it before you went to that next feature. But most organizations, again, this is again from that same survey uh, that we did, most organizations release um, every day, if not multiple times a day. Right? And gone are the days when you release once in three months. But overlay that with how often uh, you are analyzing your application for vulnerabilities, not many applications are analyzed every day. So if you overlay this number when 70 percentage of organizations are releasing multiple times a month, less than 82 percentage um, or 82 percentage are scanning less than a month. Right? So it's clearly a huge disconnect of how often you're releasing and how often you're looking for vulnerabilities. So if these two are disconnected, well, definitely that initial uh, discontent on productivity will exist. And yeah, 18 percentage release daily or more with 0.3 percentage scanning daily. That's a huge disconnect here. So then we spoke to the AppSec teams and said, Hey, like we see this disconnect. What, what, what do you, what, what are you guys doing about it? And they said, okay, yeah, we are gonna try to put security um, further left and hoping to catch vulnerabilities earlier. So one common thing AppSec likes to put it is in the IDE, right? So they say, okay, hey, let's put this into the IDE. Um, I'm sure most developers are familiar with it. If you're not, think of these as um, when you start typing, it is going to give you immediate feedback. Um, it's going to underline, it's going to squiggly line under your code, um, giving you feedback. And then when you do like a mouse pointer, it's going to give you a uh, hover uh, information. But then we then spoke to developers about this and developers say that is exactly where our productivity is most inhibited. Uh, because they give us examples like I declare a variable it gives me immediate feedback saying that variable is not being used. I'm like, yeah, I know because I just declared it, like give me time to use it. So that feedback is absolutely meaningless. But when a squiggly line comes under your piece of code or when there is like, it's highlighted in a different color, your attention is drawn to it. Um, and even if you know it is to be, it is meaningless, but most, Organizations, you don't let you don't let the developers switch those messages off, and so you're forced to keep seeing those feedback. So that's one problem. And um, developers who have who've come from the early days of uh, Microsoft tools, they compared it to like uh, uh, the Clippy tool in, in Microsoft Office, right? Where when you start writing something, it immediately pops up and says, "Hey, looks like you're writing a letter. Can I help you?" and it is definitely not useful. So um, so yeah, so what AppSec thinks is gonna solve that problem is going to reduce a disconnect. Developers feel that is adding on to that productivity inhibition. So that is not good. So then we spoke to, so AppSec folks were not having a tool to help fix this. So then we spoke to developers to see, okay, hey, what? 
what would you guys think is a good solution? So they said, what works for us today in, in the development lifecycle is the feature bugs remediation workflow, right? We are so used to that workflow that totally works for us. These are things that developers do, right? Where they have unit tests as part of the pull request, some automation, a test automatically for certain things. They get immediate feedback and they're able to fix it. And they don't have this productivity inhibition there, right? In fact, this actually enables their productivity even better. And right? so how that would work is I make a commit, I create a pull request, this automation in my repo, in my build system, to do unit tests on that latest code. I get immediate feedback. I can then make a fix and I can move on. Now, why is this good? Why does this work for developers? Well, one is developers never leave their environment, right? I am in my repo, I'm in my IDE, I'm in, in that focus zone working on my piece of code and I'm getting immediate feedback that is relevant to what I'm working on. It is not telling me of all the other issues in the system. It is not coming to me three weeks later. It is coming to me as soon as I make the change. And so it's relevant and it is trusted because it is based on what I defined or my team defined. And we are also tweaking that definition as we go, right? So like when, uh, say for instance, I'm taking a new input from the customer, I would add a unit test for that. Or if I see that there is a bug that was created, I can add a unit test to ensure that bug doesn't happen again. I can uh, add unit test to fix regressions. Right? So, so this unit test is evolving and that is what is being applied. So it is very trusted. The feedback is trusted. And the, the, the developer team also likes this because as I mentioned, the as you go, you are improving the unit test. So the quality standards are also increasing. And this is what is being enforced before the code is getting merged, right? So, so that is further improving bugs from coming down later in the pipe. And so my code quality is going up. And the feedback is to the person who wrote the code. So there is that individual accountability as well, right? Where if my unit test fails, my code reviewer, my peer reviewer will be seeing it. And so, of course, the peer review wouldn't happen before that unit test gets fixed. And then the developer has that urge to get this thing fixed, right? It is not an after, afterthought, um, so that individual accountability goes up. And over time, like if the unit test has things like, um, okay, let me test the input um, length, right? Say if I have a password field, uh, let me enforce our password policies as a unit test. And what then happens is developers adapt their coding style for the organization. Right? So you do that three times, automatically going forward, when you use a password field, you know what those checks need to be. And so those checks are also put in place, the unit test would pass. And so the developer is also improving and, and meeting standards of the organization uh, automatically, right? They're being trained on the job. So the, the feedback from the developers is this workflow works really well for us. Right? And the unit tests are also just easy to maintain, update, fix, adapt. Um, I, I don't need um, a lot of knowledge to like create those. And then when a new person comes on board, also it is easy to look and maintain. So, so then we are trying to see, okay, okay, we get this feedback from the security team, we're getting this feedback from the dev team, and then we looked at what security team uh, creates as rules today for security. And then we realized, okay, those are extremely complicated, right? Where uh, there is no easy way to communicate to the app team as to what the security rules are. Now, they might say that, okay, hey, this is a external facing application which touches the production database, so it should not have any SQL injection vulnerabilities. 
Now that is easy as a statement, but now when you're working across 200 microservices uh, with different teams working on it, uh, I mean, there is no single source of truth to maintain all these rules, right? The app team, when they're context switching, they don't realize or they don't know, okay, hey, what does this app um, need to adhere to? Unit test is easy because it is part of the repo. I can just open up the unit test. I can look at, oh, okay, these are the things that this app uh, is being tested on. Um, so I know what to uh, focus on. So then we said, okay, we need security rules that doesn't require a PhD to, to build and maintain and, and, and to communicate, right? It should be simple. It should be easy to read. It should be like unit test. It should be human readable build rules, security rules. Right, so some uh, example on the left-hand side, right? Where it says, okay, I'm gonna compare your code to master branch and I'm gonna look for vulnerabilities and you should not have any SQL injection vulnerabilities that are marked as critical. That's it, simple, straightforward, and it is easy to define, it's easy to update. And these rules can be maintained wherein it could be different rules for different applications, right? So when I'm writing, when I'm working on a new application, I can look at these rules and I'm like, oh, okay, so the security team believes we should not have any critical SQL injection. Okay, so I'll be extra careful when I am touching anything that um, is uh, SQL and SQL related, like any, any query related code, I need to be extra careful. And then it's also, you could have different rules for different stages of the application, right? Wherein um, when I'm writing code for staging environment, uh, when I know that it is internal database, it's never touching outside, maybe these rules are a bit more lax. So it's easier for me to test and, and get the feature out. Um, and when it's going into, when it's being promoted into prod, that is when maybe the next set of rules are applied, right? Um, so that again helps productivity, right? Where um, I don't need to get everything rock solid uh, because all of these things, um, might require a lot of checks and balances in place um, and it might take you away from focusing on the feature right? so if the staging requirement is slightly relaxed that might help me get it into staging first and then work on um, putting those controls in place so it is easy for developers and it's easy for um, appsec teams as well right? there is no like communications or meetings required this is also a simple yaml file that could be maintained in the code repo and the, the developers then understand uh, what is required of them so um okay. i'm just taking a look at the questions window to see if anything is coming in um so yeah so, so this is the feedback that we received from both the app team and this the, the developer team so we were asking ourselves the question, okay, so is it possible to use dev-friendly security rules in a modern CI-CD environment? Right? So that, that is what that, that conversation boils down to and the topic of the webinar. Um, so what I have next is to give a quick demo of a, a similar system in action. Um, so we'll see how um, a, a dev friendly rules can be defined, how it can be used in a CI CD system, and then how developers would get feedback. And, and then see how it overlays with um, the, the problem statements and, and the approach that we've seen so far. Um, switching to that. Okay, so I've got, um, okay, let me do this. Okay, so I've got um, my GitHub uh, um, account open. I've got a, a sample repository here, right? Uh, it's a JavaScript um, demo app. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go in and I'm gonna update um, a JavaScript uh, code here. Right, so think of this as, okay, I'm a developer, I'm working on a specific feature, right? And um, I'm gonna make some code change. Now here, okay, this is the line of uh, 
borders. Let me zoom this in more so you guys can see this well. Okay, this should be the over. So for, for people who are familiar with JavaScript, this might be very obvious. Uh, I'll, I'll give a quick rundown. So what this does is there is this endpoint called slash user input. Um, just um, heads up, this is purposefully vulnerable application, right? So don't look at the quality of the code. This is purposefully written in a way that it's bad so that um, we can catch those vulnerabilities. Uh, so yeah, there is an endpoint called user input. Uh, there is a request and a response. And so this is an endpoint that can be hit from the outside, right? And here I've, I've just said, okay, there is an input query, is test, and that input query is then used in an eval statement. And that is the result which uh, is then sent back as a, a, a response. Now, um, so yeah, so this result is then used in the response back to the user. Now, what, what we can do here to make this um, vulnerable is there is a request from the user, right? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use that request as this, right? So I commented out what was original and then I, I use this line. And what the difference here is, instead of using something that was defined in the code, I'm gonna take what came from the user blindly, no checks, no validation, no sanitization, nothing. I'm gonna take it as it is. I'm gonna use it in the eval statement to get the result. And then I'm gonna take that result and send it back to the user. So now, I mean, there's a comment here which exactly says what's gonna happen, right? Where if I were to pass, if the user were to pass vulnerable JavaScript code, I'm gonna take it blindly and use it in the eval. And so it is going to be, um, uh, this, is, this is a vulnerability that can be easily exploited. Right? so I'm, I'm making this single line change. And what a developer would do is um, this option wouldn't be allowed, right? I'm admin to my branch, so I have the commit directly. Uh, the option the developer would be provided is creating a new branch, right? So if you think of back in the diagram, this is where I create a feature branch, I make some commits, um, and then uh, make a pull request and then, then proceed from there, right? So I'm gonna propose this change. I'm going to only make this change, right? Um, so I'll just directly create a pull request. So I'm going to create a pull request here. So you guys must be seeing, yeah, the, the view is updated. So here there's a pull request created. And in, in most organizations at this point, um, GitHub would have been, or any code repo that you use would be automated wherein on the right-hand side here, you see reviewers, that uh, would be auto-populated, right? So uh, whoever you mark as reviewers would then be notified now saying somebody's created a pull request. Um, there is no like work in progress in the title. So you are being requested to review this. But what you will see now is when I scroll down, here, there is another automation that has happened wherein it says, okay, hey, some checks haven't completed yet. Now this is where unit tests normally come in. The unit test would be automatically executed. Uh, there are a bunch of tests that will be normally executed. So one is first the build system would check if I made any uh, syntactic errors, right? Like, am I gonna fail the build? Because I mean, if the build fails, then yeah, there's no point even running unit tests or even reviewing this code. There is some fundamental issue with the code, so the developer needs to fix it. Now, if the build goes through, then that is where the unit test normally would be run, right? Wherein um, they would say, okay, let me check for um, functionality or, or code bugs in the, in the code. Uh, the example I gave, like if I were to use password, check for length of password, right? So basic check like that. But then we've gone one step beyond is where we are doing static analysis on this. Now, as I was speaking, you might have seen the screen refresh, right? Wherein it said within a minute, right? Uh, not even a minute if I um, go into the details. 
I can show you. Okay, so the checks happened. So yeah, a minute, 12 seconds, right? So a minute, 12 seconds. What it did is, this is also happening within GitHub, right? So I'm, if you see, I'm still on github.com. I've not gone anywhere outside of what my environment is. It did a check. It did a check to look at, okay, it pulled out the latest code. It um, would like build that code. It then ran next gen static analysis on it. And you see there is a cross button here. Now let's see why that cross button is. So when I scroll down, uh, let me scroll all the way to the bottom. Okay, there you go. Right, so here it said, okay, you can see what I'm highlighting. It said it failed a build rule and two vulnerabilities matched. And it's giving me some details and it said, okay, analysis check failed. Now let me go back to that view. Now you can see GitHub is starting to show it everywhere, right? So if I were to go into my pull request window, it will have a cross off there saying, this pull request has an issue, investigate. I go into this, it will say, okay, some checks were not successful. Shift lift, next gen static analysis failed. Now, why did it fail? Well, we saw the details. Now, you don't even need to go there. If you scroll up, it said, okay, there's an automatic comment. This is what you might have seen while I was speaking through what steps happen. It said, okay, there is some findings that are new. There is this vulnerability, which is a remote code execution via request. Right? And it's a critical vulnerability. Now, the, the developer at this point would be like, hmm, okay, let, let me maybe see why is this, like why was this vulnerability blind? So I go back into my repo, right? So here, if you see, I am in that code repo, shift left JS demo. I go in here and then I have the YAML file. And here the YAML file is, this is the build rule. Ah, uh, okay, so the security team says, this is a very critical application. So we just cannot have any vulnerabilities in here. Now that's a very catch all kind of security build rule. Um, it, I'm just doing it for a demo, right? Uh, but this would be um, kind of how it is defined. So here it is saying, any vulnerability, let it be critical moderator info, we are gonna catch it and we're gonna fail the build. Um, this is where tweaking can be done, right? Where you can say that, hey, okay, that is kind of too catch all. Um, that is very, um, not, that's very strict. Uh, maybe this application only needs to catch critical, right? So, so that, that those things can be tweaked. But then I'm, now I understand why or what the security check is, so I come back. And the finding is, okay, it is critical and it is remote code execution as the type. Now I'm like, okay, let me uh, go into what it is. So I click on this, I click on the ID. And so just to recap what has happened so far. So I'm still on GitHub, I've not left GitHub. I made the code change, I made the pull request. Within a minute, it automatically checked for vulnerabilities and it reported on it. And it also failed the PR, right? So if somebody were to come in to review this, they would also see this. They would see that, oh, okay, there is a vulnerability. I scroll down, there is no commits after that. So I am assuming the vulnerability still exists. I'm not gonna review this unless this check passes. Right? So the reviewer also wouldn't need to spend time on this. So I as a developer, I clicked on this, opens a new tab. It says, okay, vulnerability number 34. It's a remote code execution, injection through HTTP via request. I'm like, okay, so in source view.js on line number 11, request. Okay, let me click on that. So I click on it, it directly takes me back to the code. It says this line is where it starts. I'm like, okay, I see request, I see line number 11. Okay, I understand that. Let me go back. Okay, so it is the user input. Yep, that is a route. It goes into again another line where it says, okay, it's passed along the stack into an anonymous method, but let's see what that line is. Okay, so here, okay. So the request is coming in from line number 11 
into this line. Okay. Okay, that I understand. And it says, okay, this is now being used in eval as parameter number one. Okay, so let me, oops, I closed that. Let me open that again, eval. Okay, so it is being used in eval as parameter number one. Okay, okay, so that I understand. Right, so as a developer, I understood saying, okay, so this is the flow, I understand the flow. It says it is a remote code execution. Now, maybe I'm new um to security uh, maybe i don't i don't understand all of these things as a developer um so let me see description it says okay stp data is used in a shell command without undergoing escaping or validation right this could allow an attacker to execute code on the server and it gives a full description countermeasures as you can prevent it by parameterizing it or validating it before using it right and there is all these additional information that you can get so it's an OSP one type of vulnerability, it's an injection vulnerability, it's common web exploit, 77, 78, 917. So it, it, it hits all of these classifications. Um, and then it is me looking at it, so I don't need to assign it to someone. But if it was the reviewer seeing it, if it's a security team who got notified seeing it, I can come in and I can um, change the status. I can assign it to someone in the system saying, hey, take a look at this. I can add a comment here saying, hey, um, please look at this one. It is a right? So I could put a comment like this. So somebody comes at this, they can look at this. Right? And so then I can fix it and then I can immediately get this resolved. And if I were to go into applications and I go into the code, you can see here, um, if I were to compare this to my master branch, yeah, it immediately says, yeah, this is the two regressions that you had, right? So this command code injection, and I think I made another change in another line before we made the PR. So it's also having an unsafe regular -like expression. Right? So it is giving me that exact thing that we just saw. And if you go to comments, you will see the comment that I put in, right? So it, it also sees, shows that somebody's taken a look at it and, and we need to resolve this. So if I were to make that fix and then rerun it, if I were to remove that um, line, um, it, would, it would resolve the issue. Right? So this is how you get immediate feedback. Now going back to the webinar slides. So you saw it is dev friendly, right? In the sense it is in the environment, you never had to leave it. You're getting immediate feedback on the lines that you made changes and you're getting immediate feedback. That is very key here because if the feedback comes to you hours later, days later, it's not useful. And um, I mean, from a, from a real world perspective, um, so one of our customers, Emirates Airlines, a major um, global airline organization, they implement something like this in all of their pull requests, right? So their engineers are able to fix vulnerabilities way faster, way more efficient. Um, when they compared um, what they used to have to what they do now, one of the key metrics they look for is MTTR, mean time to resolution. Mean time to resolution is how long does it take from the vulnerability getting in to in getting fixed. So there's a month over month decline wherein they are now seeing vulnerabilities getting fixed in that same sprint, right? Same sprint, meaning somebody wrote a code and before it even gets into master branch, it's getting fixed. Um, some of them are getting fixed the very same day, right? The, the moment they get feedback, developers are like, oh yeah, I realize it, I understand it, put in a fix. And most importantly, the last line, wherein the engineers like this process, right? Where it's, it's, usable it's it's easy it is exactly like how they fix bugs they write a piece of code they realize oh yeah i didn't think of that edge case i fixed that bug same way a vulnerability is also now like a bug fix so across our other customers as well there is a 110 time 110 times increase in how code is being scanned, right? Because now code can be scanned as soon as changes are made. So obviously people are using it more. Mean time to reduction, uh, remediation is improving by leaps and bounds. 
70 percent of your vulnerabilities get fixed the same sprint uh, it is not because they don't want to it's not because they can't fix everything it's more to do with the rules right wherein if there are info level vulnerabilities or if there are like good to fix kind of issues um, the security team might have defined the rule which says okay these can be ignored for now so they don't bother fixing it and of the vulnerabilities fixed 12 percent of them are being fixed the same day as well so that, that's that's a um, remarkable improvement so uh, talking to our customers when they look for solutions like these i've just listed down some of the things that they look for in a solution right so um, I, I hope this would be useful when you also evaluate solutions anything that um, looks for security vulnerabilities in code should be purpose built with the developers in mind right it should be developer as a first principle um, wherein it is all the things that we've talked about um, not leaving their environment uh, developers like to get access to data they don't want yet another dashboard um, as you saw when the scan happened the results come in the pr comment right it didn't say that hey go log into this system and then find your results there now it's immediate feedback in the pr and with links where i could click on it and it shows me the result right i didn't have to log in anywhere um it should be fast we've seen that um concurrent scanning right so i shouldn't be where when i make a code change i shouldn't be waiting in queue for my scans to happen right uh, if you saw in the example that i did i didn't even click a button anywhere saying scan my code it just happened right? i didn't have to schedule it i didn't have to wait in line i didn't have to um, ask someone to do it for me nothing it just happened um, and then it all happened within github right there were absolutely no hardware limits or restrictions the the entire demo that i did happened on the cloud i mean i'm doing it from my laptop nothing is running on my laptop except my browser everything was on uh, github environment and uh, shift left environment um, it's accurate, right? So we were showing to the line of code, um, very relevant um, vulnerability finding, right? And it is not just searching for patterns, right? If I was searching for eval statement, um, the vulnerability would have been there in the first code, right? Uh, so for instance, there are tools which does just blind grip like um, patterns. So the issue with that is now, that is another thing I, should have mentioned so the reason i keep this commented in my line here this line of code sometimes a lot of um, tools would uh, say hey you're using eval or here also use your eval and they will say okay eval statement is being used this is a potential vulnerability because they're just looking for patterns right no, but we are not doing that when when this was in use we didn't say this was a vulnerability because we are using data flow analysis so like we know this is coming from here it didn't come from the outside so this is benign but the moment this became this that is when we say it is a vulnerability right so um it is accurate and then it is enables developers to learn and enables developers to teach the tool back right i can um teach the tool saying hey no this is my sanitization routine this is my validation routine um, you should be able to teach the tool back to make it more customizable so look for that in the tools that you are evaluating and the build rule right so that is uh, what we refer to what our customers refer to as where application security team defines a rule and it is automatically enforced for any code change Right? It is not where the AppSec team comes in and says, let me do my security analysis on your code. It's fully automated. The AppSec team defined it. The developer team can review it. And I showed you the build rule YAML file. So it is easy to use. And last but not the least, it should be comprehensive. Right? Um, we see solutions in the market which does incremental scan, um, wherein it uh, an example we give is say we changed one line of code here right i changed that line of code to take the input from the customer versus input from the uh, inside of the code now if i do incremental scan depending on 
the, the tool you use, some tools would see this change and they don't, they are like, okay, it used to be eval, it is still eval, you just see in the input. They're not looking at the entire code, so they might not see where that input is coming in from. So there is a pot potential false negative there. Um, so what we do is comprehensive full scan of your entire code base or for their application whenever it's being scanned. And also it should be comprehensive where it's not just looking for robust opt-in. One of the issues that you saw in the demo is it pointed out uh, unsafe regular expression usage, right? So it's also looking for potential unsafe coding practices or as top 10 vulnerabilities, um, sensitive data leaks, right? Are you leaking data anywhere? Are you writing stuff to a log file that you should not be writing into like payment information, uh, PII data, um, anything that can um, um, jeopardize your regulatory standards? Right? So it should be comprehensive. Right? So these are some of the things that um, uh, we recommend you look for in solutions um, that enable security. So we've got about 15 minutes left. Um, I'll, I'll leave it this slide. Uh, there, there is a free account option at Shift Left. Uh, it is free, not a trial. Uh, you can register yourself at shiftleft.io forward slash register. Or if you are uh, a user on GitHub, you could go to the GitHub marketplace and look for us there as well. Uh, it enables you to use GitHub as a repository. It enables you to use GitHub Actions as your CI environment. Um, so everything happens to the cloud. You don't need any software installation or download. We are also completely SaaS. So you can evaluate us. Uh, and again, it's not an evaluation trial. It's a free, free account, so you can keep using it. Um, and then we also provide some demo applications, right? like the one that I use in the demo is also part of the repository. Um, so you will see that when you sign up. So you can try it out for yourself. So at this point, I'll go into um, Q and A. Bunch of questions coming in. Plenty of time for question and answer period, guys. So if you do have a question for Aaron, go ahead and use your GoToWebinar control panel and submit your questions. Okay. So there's a question saying, shouldn't the vulnerability reported be synced into project planning before we work on it? Well, yeah, that is how big organizations do when scanning is done after the fact. And that's another big issue, right? Wherein if I wrote the code, it's already in production, well, giving me feedback at that point, I'm not gonna go in and start changing the code. It has to go through um, like a bug fixing procedure, right? Wherein it has to go into Jira and then I would then take it up, I would get it scheduled into one of my future sprints and then I would work on it. But think of this as like your unit test feedback, right? If your unit test says this is bad, would you say I wouldn't work on it till it goes into Jira? No, I mean, the onus is on you to fix it right there because otherwise your code itself wouldn't get reviewed and it would never get promoted. And that is what we are trying to do for even security vulnerabilities, right? Wherein we are trying to um, give you immediate feedback and you're taking off that um, the Jira project management place out of it because this is, feedback on the line of code that you just wrote. So you can just fix it right there. Uh, think of it as unit test feedback. Do you have REST API to pull some metrics and details and vulnerabilities on a branch? Uh, yes, uh, all the information that you see um, in the UI, um, the information that came into GitHub, into the pull request, all of that is available over API. That, like, GitHub is calling our APIs to get that information. Uh, so what you saw in the GitHub as a, in the demo where it said, uh, this is the vulnerability ID, this is the vulnerability, this is the, the severity of the vulnerability, all of that is available over uh, our REST APIs. And, and that is how it gets put, yes. And yeah, it is possible at the branch level, app level, scan level, org level, um, all of these is possible. Um, how, how do you compare to GitHub code scanning? Um, so yes, we, we are 
aware of their solution. We have looked at it. That is one of the things we mentioned about being comprehensive, right? So there are code scanning tools out there. What they start off with is um, linting of code. Linting of code is the thing that I mentioned about um, grep-like pattern-based code analysis, which is good for that initial set, right? Where if you're new to coding and you don't know best practices, it's good. But then it is pretty noisy. It can give out a lot of output because you're not looking at context, you're not looking at data flow. Um, it is looking at, um, think of this as you reading a piece of code without looking at what's above it and below it. Right? Because even for pattern-based matching, the more complicated the pattern-based matching is, the more compute intensive it is, right? Like you could write regular expressions which are backtracking so much, the parser is going to like just time out because it's going to eat up so much resources. So purposefully these linters are not very comprehensive. Uh, and that kind of scanning is not going to find deep rooted vulnerabilities, right? Where in the example that I showed you, um, the variable just jumped one line. But imagine that variable is going through a lot of transforms, being jumped across methods and files, and finally ending up in something that is used in a query. It is very tough to catch unless you are comprehensively scanning it. You need to do something like data flow analysis, um, just grepping for it wouldn't catch it. And so, so how we differentiate ourselves against competition is the comprehensiveness fact, where we can look for deep, vulnerabilities in addition to what other scanners do where I showed you the example where we look for unsafe regular expression usage. That is very straightforward and any scanner can do it. So it doesn't mean that we don't do it, we do that too, but we go way beyond that. Um, container-based solutions. So because container-based solutions, uh, the question is how do we compare to container-based solutions? Container scanning, um, or container solutions uh, are different in two ways. So container um, solutions do a bunch of things. One is they scan for um, vulnerabilities in the container itself, right? So like if you're using a, an image of a container, you're saying that, okay, I'm using Ubuntu version X, which has Apache version Y, that has a known vulnerability those tools do that. Um, we don't do that because what we are looking for is vulnerabilities in the code and the application that you create, not where you run it in, right? So that is one difference. Container scanning doesn't do uh, code scanning, right? They're not looking for vulnerabilities in your application, in your code. Second is um, that is also a runtime, right? Container is also more right, where it is more in the deployment environment what we are doing is even before that code ever gets run, we are looking for vulnerabilities in your code. And we are like trying to prevent um, vulnerable code from ever making it into even staging, right? You could even call it that. And um, for container scanning, again, it is normally not, again, happening for the right. Uh, so it is not immediate feedback to the developer, right? I mean, the code has to make it pass a review and then get deployed somewhere in the container for the scanning to happen. Um, do you have a project in Python language? Yes, yeah, if you sign up for the free account, you can see there are Python demo apps. Um, so yeah, you can definitely try it out there. You'll be able to see it. Um, how do we get to know the list of policies which are available? So, I'm trying to see what you're referring to here. So if you're looking at what policies are used on our code, um, yes, they are visible. They are, they can be pulled out of our system. You can, yeah, definitely then customize it, customize it as well. And that's the second question. Can we customize the policy? Uh, yes, so that's where I said, uh, developers should have the ability to teach the tool, right? So wherein you, the common use cases, okay, remote code execution. Now the countermeasure to that is validate the input. 
Now, each language, each framework would have recommended validations. But for big organizations, you might have in-house validation methods, which our scanner wouldn't be able to understand, right? So the policy can be customized and updated, but when you teach the tool saying, this is my in-house validation, and so we then be treated as such. So if we see it, then we wouldn't call it a vulnerability. And right? so yes, those policies are customizable to teach the tool. Uh, does it scan dependency jars? Uh, yes, it does. Um, so uh, we do on both levels. So imagine you have one application written in your how in house, which uses dependency jars, which are also developed in house. Yes, then we would scan the entire application. We are not looking only at the code that you just wrote. Again, goes back to that being comprehensive, right? Because a lot of times vulnerabilities are caused by using dependencies in a wrong way, right? So when we call a method in a dependency and we just pass an input to it, the dependency might expect you to validate the input before sending it. And then this is true for in-house dependencies and external dependencies too, right? Like if you have a, an external framework that you use to um, manipulate databases, that method expects you to validate the input um, because the database framework is not going to um, handle SQL injection vulnerabilities on its own. So yes, so we do that. Let me take just one more question before I hand it back uh, for the, the price trial. So I would assume code scanning plus container scanning are needed. Yes, that's correct. Uh, because these are addressing two different use cases. Um, they are not complementary. Uh, sorry, they are not overlapping, they're complementary. They do two different use cases. So yes, you would need uh, both. Um, where the code is, where was this compiled code? So are scripted languages where the code is closed. Okay, so I think you're referring to where the source code is not available. So for some languages, yes, we can do that. For like things like Java, we can work off the jar file, which is compiled bytecode, uh, but then some languages, they are just too um, obfuscated for us to make any sense of it. So then we would need code for that to be scanned. Okay, um, I think that's it. Let me pass it back to the um, panel. So Charlene, back to you. Okay. All right, great. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, wow, so many great questions. I was surprised at how many came in. That that was amazing. If we didn't get to your question, uh, please know that Aaron and the folks at Shift Left are going to get a copy of all of the questions that came in. So I'm sure he or somebody from his organization will be more than happy to follow up with you offline. But thank you to everybody who did submit questions. Um, really impressed with the with the volume and the quality of the questions that came in so thanks very much uh, as Aaron mentioned at the top of the hour well I, as I mentioned at the top of the hour and Aaron just uh, just mentioned we are doing a drawing for four $25 Amazon gift cards so without further ado why don't we go ahead and do that our first winner today is Jan O congratulations Jan our second winner today is Stella M. Congratulations, Stella. Our third winner is Joe G. Congratulations, Joe. And our final winner today is Janice G. Congratulations, Janice. We'll be following up with all four of you offline by email to get your Amazon gift card over to you. So check your inbox. If you don't see anything in your inbox, please check your spam filter. Also want to remind the audience that today's event has been recorded. So if you missed any or all of it, or if you just wanna watch it again, you'll have the opportunity to do so. Following today's webinar, we are going to be sending out an email that contains a link to access the webinar on demand. And the webinar is also gonna be living on the devops.com website. So you can always go find it there. Just go to devops.com slash webinars, look in the on demand section, and it should be right there waiting for you. While you're there, please check out the other webinars that we have both upcoming and on demand. Hopefully there'll be one or two that pique your interest. Aaron, thank you for a great presentation. Thank you so much, so much great information. Um, judging from the number of uh, questions that came in, like I said earlier, um, I know the audience got a lot out of it too. So thanks very much, appreciate it. 
Thank, thank you, Charlene. Thanks, everyone. I also want to thank the audience for joining me today. This is Charlene O'Hanlon, and I'm signing off. Have a great day, everybody. Please stay safe.